Romans 12, 15 says to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So today we're going to rejoice with those who've given their hearts to Jesus and he is, he is changing their life and we're so thankful. This morning we're going to be talking about the Great Commission and I want you to hear me. Sometimes we read familiar passages of scripture and we can miss the heart of the message if we're not careful. Or we can hear it and we can go, wow, well, that's just too much for me. That's too big. Like, that is impossible. Like, God's going to have to handle that. And we don't realize our part. And sometimes maybe it's because the church hasn't preached the things that we need to preach on those simplistic truths. But today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. I want to stop right here for just a minute so that you know the context of this scripture. This happened after the resurrection. Jesus has spent 40 days walking on the earth. He's, he's revealed himself to those. He's taught masses of people. And so this is at the very end of his life on earth. He sends word, tells the disciples where to meet him. It says when they saw him, some worshipped him, but some still doubted. You have to understand, the Lord understands our doubt. We can't live in it because it will override our faith. But he understands our questions. He understands those things that we have a hard time wrapping our mind around. He understands that. Verse 18 says, Jesus came and he told his disciples, I have uh, have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is Jesus' promise to us. He would always be with us, even today, by the Holy Spirit. That is still his promise to us, that he is with us. These were his final words while he was on the earth. His final words to his followers. We know this as the Great Commission, right? You've heard of it as the Great Commission of our faith. We cannot miss the importance of what this means for us as believers. A commission is a command or it's instruction that's given to a person or a people for a particular function or duty. It is an instruction or a command that's given to us for a particular function or duty. So we have to ask ourselves, then what is that? What is that command that the Lord is giving us here? It's not just to have people get saved in our church and then baptize them and then just move forward and try to get more people saved and baptized. There's something deeper here that the Lord wants us to see. Jesus at this time, he commissioned his followers. He said, go now, it is your duty to make disciples to make more Christ followers on the earth he was leaving them as his representatives right to pick up where he had left off and then he said go make disciples and then teach them everything that I have taught you verse 19 says therefore go and make disciples this word therefore is a linking word when you see the word therefore in the scripture you have to consider what is he saying now and what did he say just before that okay Because this would be very different if the scripture said this. The eleven came, they went to the mountain, they found Jesus. Jesus came and said, go and make disciples. But there's a sentence right before that that we cannot miss. And Jesus says this. He says, I have been given all authority on earth and in heaven. Therefore, 
go make disciples. What Jesus is saying is I have been given all authority, and because I have all authority, I am commanding you now to go and make more disciples. See, it's not an option for us. It's not an option. We don't just live trying to keep sin out of our heart and trying to make it to heaven one day. Our lives are here to reproduce more Christians. Like that is our whole function and duty as unto the Lord. It's our responsibility. This command was not just for the 11 disciples and the women that were following along. It's for each and every believer in every generation. It's the last words of Jesus He was saying, this is the responsibility of my church after I leave, to go and make disciples. He's not talking about the five-fold ministry. He's not saying, everybody, you've got to be uh, 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 apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Those are gifts that he's given to some to be used specifically in his church. This is not evangelism. This is a command by Almighty God, by through, through Jesus on the earth, that we are to go. And he's chosen us as his vessels now to carry on what he began on the earth. It's an amazing thing that he's, that he's chosen us. He wasn't talking about just evangelism. He is talking about a command to spread the good news, to take it to all who will receive. We're never told to go and make converts. You understand? We are never told to just go out and try to get people saved. Let's just get them saved and get them baptized. And, oh, we're so proud of you. Pat them on the back. We're so, we're, so, we're so thankful for what God's doing in your life. We are told to make disciples. That means a devoted follower of Christ. That means we walk with him. That means we walk this thing with them. We walk it with them. We're told we need to model Christ before others. How else can we make a disciple unless if it's not by our words, our attitudes, our actions, our behavior, the way that we treat others? So Jesus here is simply saying, model me before others and find the opportunity to share the good news that I didn't come to the earth to judge them. I came to the earth to save them. And then spread the truth into their life as as much as you can. Our message to the lost and the undone cannot be one of condemnation or shame. We cannot be condemning or shaming those who are without Jesus. They're just living like lost people live. Many of us were there before. Many of us were there before. We will never win people into the kingdom by shaming them or condemning them. Jesus didn't come to do that, and neither should we. He says in his word that everything that is, should be centered around repentance and forgiveness of sin. You may think, well, this is a very simple message. This is, this is what I need you to hear this morning. It is, I don't know that I was ever really understood or was ever truly taught that it is my responsibility individually. I know I'm supposed to live Jesus, right? I know that I'm supposed to keep my heart pure that I'm supposed to look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, walk like Jesus. But I don't know that I was ever truly taught until I was an adult that I really am accountable to the Lord and responsible to the Lord to try and go and not just make converts and win them to Jesus, but walk alongside them and be in their life and just carry this thing with them. I don't know that. I understood the scripture. I knew the Great Commission. But many times the Great Commission is spoken of as an evangelism tool, as an outreach tool, as a missionary thing. You can't go, so send your money because somebody else can go. How many's heard that? Have you heard that? Because the church has misappropriated the scripture. The Lord is not talking about evangelism here. He is not talking about sending missionaries around the world. We do those things. That is what we're called to do. We're to give so they can go. Because he said what? Baptize them in, in, into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in all nations. But that's not the only thing he is saying. And that is what we need to see here this morning. We sometimes get caught up in this being about evangelism. But what the heart of the Lord is here is we need to go and we need to preach repentance and we need to preach the forgiveness of sins. I want you to see in Luke 24, I don't have a scripture for this, but these are also the other last words of Jesus that was recorded from Luke's vantage point. 
He recorded Jesus saying, Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. There he says it again. To all nations, to all creeds, to all, all races, to everyone who will receive. We have to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. These were the very last words of Jesus before he left this earth to go back to heaven where he still is today. Waiting for the Father to say, now go get my church. These were the very last words that he said, I have all authority and now I'm commanding you in my place to go and to make disciples. Not to condemn, not to shame, but to offer them salvation, to offer them Jesus and forgiveness of sins. But we cannot offer people forgiveness of sins in Jesus. We cannot tell them about Jesus. Oh, he'll love you. he loves you. He will forgive you of your sins without teaching them about repentance. Because what happens is then we have a lot of people who come and they pray the sinner's prayer. They ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. But they're never taught about repentance. Repentance means to turn away from the sin and turn towards God. Repentance means you have a change of mind and a change of attitude and a change of heart towards God. Not just towards the sin. You understand, so many times we say we focus more on getting the sin out and we need to really focus more on getting more of him in. So repentance is not just I'm going to quit doing that. I'm going to quit doing that. I'm going to quit doing that. Repentance is I'm going to turn away from that sin, but I'm going to turn intentionally towards God. I'm going to try to learn of him. I'm going to read his word. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be with other believers. This is what repentance is. And, 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 and Jesus says in his very last statements to those he loved so dearly that he lived so closely with on the earth. The last words. Go and spread the good news that I came to save them. But in order for salvation to take place, you have to let go of the old when you become new. You have to. You have to. We have to preach repentance. Preach Teach, share, because it's all of us. It's not pastors. It's not evangelists. This was to everyone who was a follower of Christ. Repentance, a change of heart, a change of attitude towards God. He must increase. I must decrease. Every single day, every day, we make that choice. In order to put on the new life, the new person of Christ, we have to leave behind our old ways. There has to be a separation of the old things. This word, I want you to see this. This is verse, um, verse 19. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. This word go literally means this. Journeying on a passageway. As you are going. As you are going, make disciples, is what Jesus was saying. As you're going about your life, make disciples. As you're going on your pathway of life, wherever it leads you, make disciples. As you're raising your family, make disciples. As you're going to your school, make disciples. As you're on the job, make disciples. As you're talking to your neighbor, make disciples. If you're at the coffee shop, those people that are in your life, we individually are supposed to be making disciples. That means we're just supposed to be demonstrating Christ to them so that they see our love and devotion for God so that then they desire Him. And then when they desire Him, and they become eventually devoted to Him because you're able, then you have the access to speak into their life. Why? When they see Jesus in you, and they see something real, and they know that it's truth, and they know that it's love, and it's genuine. You gain access into their life. And then that's when he says, now go, and you teach them everything. See, first he said, make the disciple. First model Christ before them. Get access into their life. And then you teach them everything that I've taught you. Everything that I've taught you to go isn't to put money into evangelism or outreach or missionaries. Yes, we do that. Because the church needs to have outreach. And we need to send missionaries all over the world where we cannot go. And we do that. But that's not all it's talking about here. It truly is an individual thing that we go and we, on our journey, we are intentional every day of modeling Christ and gaining access to other people's lives. That is the great 
Commission. I looked this up this morning. Lifeway Research Group. You know, Lifeway um, Resources. Um, I, I believe it's a Baptist organization. Used to be out of, out of Nashville. Anyway, great resources. Lifeway Research Group. They did a nationwide, some nationwide surveys. And I want you to hear this. More than a half of unchurched Christians, I mean, sorry, Americans, unchurched Americans, more than a half of them say that they're Christians, but they're in no way connected with the body of Christ. More than a half of unchurched Americans, they're Americans who do not go to church, but if you ask them, they would tell you they're a Christian but they're in no way connected to the body of Christ. Of the church Christian or the church Americans, people who attend church, about a fourth of them, only 25% say that they feel strong in their faith. Yet they go to church. And these are people who go to church an average of twice a month. Half of them say that they're comfortable in their faith. Yet 80% of them say in, this, in the six months prior to this survey that they had not shared their faith with anyone in any way. 50% of them said that they would be willing if others would talk to them. So we've got a church that now is, is silent. We've got a church of, of, of people that now, according to this poll of people who, who say, I, I don't know how strong I am in my faith. I don't know if I'm strong enough to go and share Jesus with others. Hear me. This is, this is what the whole commission is about. This is what all it is. It's, truly, it is not about us. It's not about what we know. It's just leading people to Jesus. You don't have to be a scholar of the Word. Just tell them there is the Word. Give them a Bible. Show them how to start in the book of John. Truly, you don't have to know all things. Lead them to the one who does. You don't have to fix everything. You don't have to know how to fix everything. You can literally say, I don't know, but I know someone who has the answer. Like everything, everything about this great commission needs to be focused on God's ability and on who he is and the fact that we just get to partner with him. All we have to do is say, let me tell you what he's done in my life. I don't know what he, wa- he needs to do in you. I don't know what he wants to do in you, but I can tell you what he's done for me. I am telling you, we need to do this. This is the commission, and it's not an option. This is what I need you to see today. This was a command of the Lord. The last command that he gave before he left this earth, that we go and make disciples. He was saying this, as you go through life, Be aware of your words and your example because our lives are supposed to point others to him. Everything about our lives is supposed to point others to him. If we look at this and don't understand, it's very simplistic, but it's very powerful. If we don't understand the context of this, this is why there's just so many people that are untouched by the church and that don't want anything to do with the organized church. Is because we don't look any different than the world. Why? Because they're not seeing or hearing anything different. It's not condemnation, guys. This is not condemnation. This is truth. Like Jesus said, I, I, am, I am going away, and I want you to go now, and I want you to make other disciples, other people who are devoted to Jesus just like they were. I want to go through a couple of things about why we share our faith. I want to go through, this is very different from the, uh, for y'all that are guests this morning, but I really feel like we've got, we've got six, seven people this past week that gave their hearts to Jesus through either Sunday morning, Wednesday night, or one just over the telephone. And then we're singing songs about wanting revival, and we want the fresh, God is moving. That is Revival. He is moving. He is doing things. And so what this is, is this is a very simplistic message this morning that was the last command that our Lord and Savior gave us that we need to understand we are responsible for carrying that now to the world. We we can't sit back and say, oh, God, send revival, send revival, send revival, but don't send me. I mean, I know. It can be so uncomfortable. 
But you begin to do it, and the more you do it, the easier it is. And the more you do it, the more you want to do it. Because you see that it gives people hope. You see that it sparks something in their life. And it's Jesus. So very simply, as you're going along in your journey of life, point others to Jesus. Be aware that he has given us this responsibility. I mean, what an honor it is that he's chosen us to carry his life on the earth. Tell others about his hope. Tell them about salvation. Tell them about forgiveness of sins. But you've got to remember to teach them about repentance. Encourage them. You have to lay down your old ways if you're really going to find salvation in Jesus. You've got to teach them that. And then this, teach them that they don't have to do this by themselves. He will give them the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't saying you have to, you have to do it in this order. You have to be baptized before you receive salvation. He was saying, because your sins have been forgiven, be baptized. And you receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. So now you can go out and show your love and devotion for God by the way you live. And then other people see it. And they're like, what is that that you have? What is that peace you have? Why is it that you got it all together and everything's falling apart around you? What is the peace that you have? Why, how can you be joyful in the midst of all of this? Like, how can you be? And then you get to say, well, because I have Jesus in my heart. He's my peace. Without him, I would be falling apart. I mean, you just gain access every day. Spread a little light here, spread a little light there. That is the Great Commission. And we are all, all charged to do that. All of us are charged. He doesn't say based on your personality. He doesn't say based on how much you know of him. He doesn't say based on how much of the word you can quote. He said, go and just share the Jesus that you have. How whatever you know of him, share it with others. Because your sins have been forgiven, then he said, go and be baptized. Let them know you'll receive the Holy Spirit. He'll help you. He's our helper. He's our comforter. That's what he's called in Scripture. He'll lead us. He'll guide us. He'll direct us. We can tell him, hey, he'll comfort you. He'll strengthen you. You won't have to do this alone. Spreading the good news of Jesus is first letting them know he didn't come to condemn them. He came to love them and set them free from the grip of, of hell and death and sin. To tell them that they have a helper in the Holy Spirit. And then to challenge them to live differently than the world. That's where the repentance comes. Acts 2.40. Peter said this in his message, like right after the day of, or right, right as the day of Pentecost came. As he begins to preach, he tells them, separate yourselves from this crooked generation. When we are sharing Jesus with others... We don't condemn them. But how will they know if we don't tell them? You have to turn away from sin. And you have to strive to grow in Jesus. Peter said, tell them, turn away from this evil generation. James 4, 4 says, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or or hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Doesn't mean he doesn't love them. But if you're going to have the, if you're, you're going to live a call, according to the culture of the world, the standards of the world, you cannot call yourself a child of God. That sounds harsh, but what he's saying here is no, because I've provided this great way through Jesus. You can have life and life to the fullest and all the spiritual blessings that come with having the Holy Spirit in your life. But it's your choice. See, that's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. And we all have been charged to handle that and carry that forth. Finally, before I call the worship team up, Romans 10, 9 through 15. This is the New Living Translation. It says this. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you were made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you were saved. Let me stop here. 
To believe in your heart is to believe not just with your mind. Okay, I heard you say that, so I believe it. No, it's to have a knowing deep inside of you. That is truth. We don't just hear it and go, oh, okay, I hear you, and I'm going to go, and I'm, I'm going to do what that says. No, it is a knowing in your soul, in the deepest part of who you are, that you died for me and that you rose again. And then we, and when we openly declare that with our mouth, when we pray, I believe this, Lord, I ask him to come into my life. When we do these things, Scripture says that we are saved. We're saved by faith. Verse 11, as the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect, meaning it's, it's available for all who will receive him. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. Hear me. He gives generously. That means he gives you all that you need for life and godliness. He gives all of himself to you. You need peace. He wants to give it to you. You need wisdom, he wants to give it to you. You need forgiveness of sin, he's not just going to forgive you a little bit. He's going to forgive you of everything. This is what Scripture's saying. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who says, he is my Lord. See, people want to say, the big man upstairs. He is my Lord. He is my master. When you can say that, then you know, you know that you are saved. When you say it, mean it in your heart. Verse 14, and this is where I'm going to wrap up today. Matthew, I'm going to ask you all to get ready in just a minute. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture says, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. How lovely are the feet of those who carry the good news of Jesus. How will they know if we don't tell them? How will they know? I understand Jesus can miraculously come and speak to people in their dreams, and he does that. There's Muslims getting saved all over the world. But most people are going to come to Christ because someone lived it in front of them. Because someone took the Great Commission and didn't just read through it, but they said, you know what, God? You commanded me to do it, and I'm taking every part of your word that I'm aware of, and I want to live it. So I'm going to get up every day, and I'm going to realize that my life is supposed to look like you, Jesus. If you said it, I'll say it. If you didn't say it, I won't say it. This is the Great Commission. This is what he's asked of us. It was given by Jesus to all who were devoted to him to go and spread the good news. I came to deliver you from sin. Do you understand? He can break off every ounce of sin off of our lives. We just have to trust him. We have to believe him. We have to accept him. Matthew, if you guys will go ahead and come on. Quickly, why to share our faith? First of all, because it's a command. Listen, this is why we need to get to a place where we can share our faith with others. Jesus doesn't save us so that we can just be a cocoon and keep sin out and one day go to heaven. He saved us to make an impact on the earth. He saved us because we have the most powerful force in the earth, love and the spirit of God inside of us. He saved us. It's a command. That's why we share our faith. The second thing is because it proves that we love him. John 14, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? If you love me, you will do what I've told you to do. So when we do that, it shows we're not, un that we're not ashamed. It shows that we love him and that we're living his life. It shows the world that's so lost and undone, it shows them something real. It shows them something genuine. We share our faith because Jesus, he, he chose us. He could have used prophets. He could have used angels. He still speaks through, through miraculous ways. But 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore, we are his ambassadors. You know what a foreign ambassador is, right? 
They get to speak for their country. They've been given authority to speak for their country. Jesus says, I've left you here as my ambassadors. I'm giving you the authority now to act like Jesus. I'm giving you the authority to pray for people. In another passage of Scripture, it tells you all the things that should follow those who believe. We should be able to lay our hands on them and pray and trust that God will heal them. We're supposed to be able to lay our hands on them and pray and believe that the the demons that torment them can be gone. That's what Scripture says. This is the Great Commission, and we get to partner with Him. We aren't just get to, we're supposed to. And when we stand before Him, I never want us to stand before Him and, and then Him say, I had all these people around you. And you never said, you never spoke my name. You you never asked to pray for them. You never tried to get involved in their life. It's not a, a judgment thing, but it's because he loves all so much. That's the next reason to share our faith. Because he desires all people. Remember, he said, go and, and share it with all nations. Teach them what you know of me. Baptize them in my name. Second Peter 3, 9 tells us that the Lord doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2 tells us that the Lord desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of his truth, that he loves them. The last reason is because, guess what? We've all sinned. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory. We all need him to save us and to rescue us. And because someone shared their faith with us at some point, somebody prayed for you, or somebody lived it in front of you, somebody modeled Christ, somebody was involved most of the time in getting you to Jesus. Maybe they prayed. Maybe they spoke truth to you. Maybe they invited you to church. If you're a Christ follower, hear me. We have been commissioned. We've been sent. And I believe he's asked us, you know, will you go? Will you go? Will you spread Jesus in your home, to your neighbors, to your workplace, to your school? Will you spread Jesus? Hallelujah. This morning, because others have spread Jesus, we have people now that want to give that, that, that want to publicly make a public statement of their faith about water baptism. Oh, Tony, will you get the children and bring them in right quick? For those that are guests, this is a, a, a different Sunday. It's a different way than I would normally preach. But I really felt led this week. We don't want to just do things in the church and just do them and not know why we do them. We don't want to just read the word and skip over the parts that we understand with our mind. Yet there are deeper things in the, in the word for our, for our heart, for our inner man. So remember, we've all been charged to go. As we go through life to model Jesus. We believe that baptism is not salvation. We believe that baptism is an outward display of what's already happened in your heart. We believe, I'm just letting you know what we believe as a church. We believe that those that are going to be baptized have already asked Jesus to come into their life to forgive them of their sins. They've promised him to walk with him the rest of their lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. But we also believe that we follow Jesus in water baptism. Because scripture says so. Go, baptize, right? In the name of the Father, Son. Jesus himself was baptized. The word baptize means to submerge. It means to immerse underwater. It's an act of obedience to scripture when we do this. When they, the going down into the water represents Jesus going down into the tomb. He took on all the sin of the world, and he went down into that tomb. He was placed in that tomb. We celebrated it last week. But then he came out on that third day, 
And when they come up out of that water, I want you to rejoice with them today. Because what that is saying is when I come forth out of this water, I'm making a public declaration that I am victorious over sin for the rest of my life. He may try to come. He may try to tempt me. He may try to make me question my faith. He may try to make me doubt. He may make me try to make me walk away from the Lord. But when they come out of this water, they can know. They already know it. But I'm telling you, I believe that when they come forth, why did Jesus say to do it? Everything that was in this word is for a purpose. So when they come forth out of that water, they come forth saying, I am victorious over everything, just like Jesus was. So that's what we're doing today. I know it's a different service. Some people are like, oh, it's a baptism service. This is an exciting service. I mean, this is, this is so exciting that these people are making a proclamation. And now they're going to go and they're going to make other, other disciples. We met with them before service. We know that we know that we know that they know Jesus. You want to go ahead and take this off if you would. So this is what's going to happen. If you're getting baptized, I need you to go ahead and start moving this way. Well, praise the Lord. This is an exciting, awesome moment for Finley as well as for everyone else. Uh, Mrs. Finley, she is nine years old. Nine years old. She's getting water baptized today. This is an incredible moment. I love it. You know, I was 21 when I got baptized, and that was great. But I love it when the young people, like, like her age, want to take this step of commitment to express their faith to the world and say, I want to live for him and be his witness. So, anyway, this is Finley. Again, I just want to, I just want to celebrate this, us to celebrate her baptism together. This is my, this is my baby, <laughs> Nathan. Um, <laughs> anyway, Nathan, would you like to say something? I'm glad I'm getting baptized. <laughs> okay. This is Mr. Patrick, and we just had the honor of meeting him last week. He actually used to work with Josh Sanders, and I think they both played a part in each other, uh, maybe finding Jesus, right? Making disciples of one another. And so last year on Easter, uh, Josh got baptized, and I hear you were an encouragement before that, even sending him Bible verses even when you, I heard, were still questioning some things. I've been told by his family. He has really been reading the word. So God's been doing a work in this young man. And last week, he gave his heart to Jesus. Would you like to say anything, Patrick? I've been waiting a long time for this. Oh. Isn't that awesome? Of the Holy Spirit to follow Him all the days of your life. Yes. On your
your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Miss Haley. Several of you already know Miss Haley. She's been a wonderful blessing in many of our lives and been a part of our church and our youth group for a time and a long time. I'm not sure how long. Would you like to say something? Um, I'm so excited for this moment. I've been waiting a while for to do this, and I'm just I'm just blessed that I get to do this today and my family to be. Haley, have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to you, you know that he is the Lord and the Savior of your heart? Yes. You promise with the help of the Holy Spirit to walk with him for the rest of your life. Yes. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And this is my other my other baby's twin. So, <laughs> this is Mr. Aaron. Uh, Aaron, would you like to say something? <laughs> I didn't tell him I was going to ask that question. I don't know. I'm happy I'm getting baptized again. Spirit. 